Um, next up, we have a panel that I'm particularly really interested in uh, called Democratizing and Decentralizing Finance. For that, we have Rune from MakeADAO, uh, Nadav from um, Dharma, and Todd from Factora. Can we have them on stage, please? And moderating the panel is our very own team member, Christine. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So this is going to be a wonderful panel. My name is Kristen Raguson, and I've been in the investment world my whole career in asset management and finance. And I've been a blockchain enthusiast for the past 10 years, primarily coming to it in the interest of monetary reform and how we can actually democratize the supply of money, the access to wealth creation. And today we have three extraordinary entrepreneurs and business owners with us who are transforming the platforms, transforming the landscape already. So I'd love to really, we have a unique chance to learn from all of them today. Um, so let's begin with uh, having each one of them introduce themselves, tell us about their businesses and how you all got into this, what really started it. So Rune, let's start with you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Rune Christensen and I am the CEO of the Mega Foundation and the co-founder of the Mega Project. And Mega, in essence, is a decentralized platform that enables the creation of a decentralized stablecoin called DAI. And um, really, the core idea of the DAI stablecoin is to combine you know, the, the stability and the usefulness and, I guess you can say, the, the, the certainty of traditional finance with you know, the fundamental characteristics of the blockchain, right? So decentralization, uh, permissionlessness, um, you know, censorship resistance, and all of that good stuff. Combined together, these two forms then create uh, essentially an infrastructure and a, and a utility that means you can actually create um, goods and services using blockchain technology that are very relevant and very easy to integrate into, you know, everyday use cases and, and the B2B use cases, but also thing like, I mean, also financial inclusion, right? Um, so yeah, we've, uh, we've recently started seeing a lot of use and sort of, uh, you know, a lot of people are starting to experiment with how the system works. It's, it's quite advanced though, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, that's really what we do. Okay, great. Thanks, Todd. Will you tell us? Quickly. <laughs> So I'm Todd Lapian. I'm the CEO of Fluidity Factora. Um, so our mission is to bring world, real world assets to the blockchain. So I come from a structured finance background. What we're focused on is creating an infrastructure layer to upgrade the current sort of uh, securitization methodology that has not been upgraded to get transparency and liquidity into real world assets. Um, it's a complicated, uh, rollout uh, framework. We have two deals that we've done. The latest deal actually will close and settle tomorrow. Um, and we actually incorporated DAI as a purchase and payment distribution option for security token holders. Yeah. And Nadav? Um, hey guys, my name is Nadav Hollander. Uh, I am the founder or co founder and CEO of Dharma. Dharma is the easiest place to borrow and lend cryptocurrency. Um, so you can think of Dharma as basically being a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform for different crypto assets. Um, and our secret sauce is that the entire platform is administered and built on smart contracts. So the entire lending transaction is wholly non-custodial and peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, we are simply kind of building this like uh, um, an easy to use interface around the underlying non-proprietary uh, smart contracts, um, and um, and yeah, that's that's all there is to say. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So, in the theme of democratization and decentralization of finance, can you each tell us a little bit about how your companies specifically are accomplishing that, or how you see it happening today, just in in today's terms? Yeah. So, so with with Maker, there's actually two aspects to it, right? So, first of all, there is just when you have a stable coin, that means we, for instance, can go to Argentina, which is one of the like one of the, the, the places we really focus on, right? Because there's quite serious inflation there, and 
that has resulted in this black market economy for US dollar bills in the streets, literally, where people will be dealing those. So, um, so it, that's just like a really good place to get sort of initial adoption for, for cryptocurrency solutions, right? Because obviously, people are really happy to get paid and to hold a dollar picked cryptocurrency instead on their phones so they don't have to carry around the cash. But there's also kind of the second aspect to, um, to the maker system, which is the collateralized lending component. So that's how you actually create the stable coin and how the, the, the stability of the system is actually maintained um, through a platform where there's complete open access for anyone to come in and actually deposit collateral assets, so, so digital assets, which right now is only Ethereum because it's built in Ethereum and it's kind of still in a beta that only supports one type of collateral. Um, but actually soon will, for instance, support um, the new like wrapped Bitcoin that's that's been added to Ethereum and, and a whole range of other assets. And I think this is kind of a, you know, like th that's a very obvious example of financial inclusion in the sense that anyone gets access to that kind of service, right? So anyone, regardless of who they are or where they are, has access to the same type of collateralized lending facility on the same terms as everyone else, right? So that's when you can finally get financed on a way that just objectively treats everyone equally. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great, super. So decentralization, when you start talking about securities, gets a little tricky. Um, as long as there's regulatory law and tax reporting obligations regarding these securities, it'll never be as truly decentralized as one might hope. However, given the typical obfuscation that has existed within the securities landscape, um, giving a transparent look through to the underlying assets is imperative. Um, so what I would say is, as the world evolves and sort of moves towards blockchain settlement and whatever protocol actually ends up becoming the predominant one, I don't think we've necessarily seen it yet. Um, you're going to start to see evolution. First, what's going to happen is you have the first wave, which is effectively, uh, you'll see consolidation around a central, uh, an agreed upon standardized framework by which to look at all real assets. Then the next phase is moving effectively all of the communication from the fiat on-ramp, off-ramp becomes a difficult prospect. It's why we wanted to incorporate DAI uh, initially um, or very early on in our process. And we'll probably move to use, utilize other stable coins as well um, just to keep that on offer. So that's a serious point of friction. Um, so as that gets resolved, then what you'll have is hopefully, um, at least in this country, you'll have some regulatory reform that will free up some of the reporting and whitelisting and a bunch of other responsibilities so we can actually make that native on-chain. And then what you should have as a result of that is, what I say, better democratized access to the opportunities with better clarity so you don't have to be some sort of rocket scientist in financial engineering in order to understand this stuff. Um, if, it get, if it can be created, it should be easily defined so that everyone can actually understand it. So it's slightly different when you start talking about security tokens at, versus you know pure crypto play. Mm, great. So um, I think a lot of my answers are going to sound like they rhyme with runes because um, I think we we have very analogous or complementary products. Um, but um, to kind of echo a lot of what of what was said previously, um, I, I think there's an underrated phenomenon happening right now in this space, which is that. There are lending facilities that are truly globally accessible by like anyone in the world via the internet that are actively used today. Um, and if you think about how special that is, um, if you say are in, I don't know, pick any random country in the world, um, let's just say you're in India, and you tried to go to lendingclub.com and you tried to take out a loan from there, you would likely not be able to because though our um, internet protocols are totally borderless and you can load the page in your browser, um, the underlying banking rails are very much localized, very much tied to uh, where you live. Um, and so it's really, really exciting because right now you, you've kind of like, for, for the first time you're actually seeing out in the wild um, financial products that have the same sort of global accessibility as like HTTP or any you know, website that you can load in your browser. 
Um, and so that's really, really exciting. Um, what that means for what they're being used for today um, is less glamorous. So, so for the most part, the, um, the borrowers in these transactions are speculators. Um, there are people who are looking to either short certain assets or um, essentially get leverage on them. Um, but I think that this space kind of evolves in concentric circles around speculation as the core use case and kind of um, iteratively edges closer and closer to uh, the mainstream user. Um, and I think over time we're going to start to see things like unsecured lending um, in dollar denominated coins like, uh, like DAI become more feasible. Um, and then hopefully these services will be um, more usable for the average consumer and not just the cryptocurrency speculator. Oh, great, thanks. Sarun, there are several stable coins out there. What makes DAI special? Yeah, so, and so there's kind of, there's two types of stable coins, right? Mm -hmm. there's, the, there's the centralized stable coins. He, I mean, the most famous one is Tether, right? A more recent, um, kind of well-accepted one is the US dollar coin by Circle and Coinbase. And actually, there's a whole other, I mean, JP Morgan just launched one, right? So it's kind of like getting a pretty, it's becoming a pretty rig, like sort of almost mainstream product, right? That, that everyone's launching, like the new ICO, I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, and, and a centralized stablecoin is just a very simple concept, right? Very pragmatic in that you have a custodian who's like this centralized trusted authority or counterparty who holds a bunch of money in the bank account, and they issue some tokens, and they promise they'll buy them back. And then, you know, if it's Tether, then it's, I mean, it's very popular due to network effect, but it's, you know, like, they're not super transparent. So this is where it gets a little bit more uh, dubious, I guess you can say. But then you have someone like, like, like Circle, right, which uh, Goldman backed and the whole nine yards, right? They got the whole thing. They got the, they got the, you know, the, the auditing and all of this stuff, right? So you can sort of trust on these, you can trust these kind of systems using the old methodology, essentially, right? Um, the problem is, of course, they're, I mean, they're centralized. They, there is the counterparty risk, you know, and the financial crisis did happen, right? So we not, can't be totally sure that they're actually, you know, always going to be stable, right? Mm -hmm. And also, it's kind of a matter where you place your trust. So as a result, that's why there's so many different ones of them. Because everyone's got a different bank that they trust or a different issuer they trust, right? And um, on the other hand, a decentralized stable coin kind of takes a, a, a bit more of a radical approach, right? Mm -hmm. So Essentially, um, the way that a, that a stablecoin like DAI works is that it's pulled the entire logic of the bank onto the blockchain. So it's kind of like using smart contracts, it's implementing an actual bank infrastructure and like essentially a bank balance sheet where it both has the tokens in circulation that are stable, but it also holds the entire you know, collateral base for the stablecoin on the blockchain itself. In trustless smart contracts, right? Where no one's got a backdoor, no one's got some special key that you, ha you, know, you have to trust them to actually give the collateral when you want it and so on, right? Um, and like the downside is that it's not as well connected into the financial system and liquidity isn't as good when it doesn't have massive scale. But then the advantage is it does in fact retain the, the fundamental characteristics of the blockchain, right? Mm. And, um, and yeah, like, What's also interesting is that these token, like these stable points actually fit very well together. So you can kind of see all, th think of all the stable points as a single network where liquidity from one can sort of pass into the others and they can all connect together as a payment system. Um, but, but ultimately, yeah, there's like pros and cons on both sides. That's fantastic. So even, you know, if we were to look at a financial crisis, DAI would be separated more from, from the direct bank, bank backing and we might have more stability on its own, even though clearly there'd be volatility. But it becomes very interesting in terms of being able to branch into the new, new realm. Yeah, although the thing is that it all comes down to what the collateral is, mm -hmm. right? That's kind of the big question anyway. Because let's say if you just back a stable coin with you know, Ethereum as collateral mm -hmm. only, right? You just put a whole bunch of Ethereum in there, the problem is one day that could just cause like a crash in Ethereum and that would then cause us, you know, the like liquidations and kind of like margin calls in the system and then just a complete wipeout, right? Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is actually need to diversify the collateral. You need to make sure that you just, you don't have one type of correlated concentrated risk, mm -hmm. but rather, you know, a hedged portfolio. And that's actually where, for instance, Factora becomes <coughs> really relevant, right? Because what they're doing is they're tokenizing real estate, for instance, right? And once this 
link between the real world and the blockchain starts getting getting closer and closer, that's when you know we can start approaching the kind of like we can create decentralized systems that can actually approach the kind of stability and the kind of, of economic scalability that traditional banks have, mm. but get rid of all the bureaucracy, okay. opaqueness, you know, all of that bad stuff, right? That was super. So that's a perfect seg segue to ask Todd, <laughs> why tokenize real estate? Well, I mean, real estate is the first asset class that we began with. Um, I think that you know, there's many other asset classes that will be soon to follow. Um, we're looking at several different asset, uh, non-real estate asset backed um, tokenizations coming up soon, I hope. Um, all depends, we're working through some issues. The idea is, so when you start talking about currency, like the currency, the full faith and credit of the US government, I mean, so what backs that? Well, tax receipts, but it's all the net worth, all the hard assets, everything. It's like the book value of this country is everything that's in this country and all of its resources. So when you start to look at that, well, as Ren was saying, um, it's not just, you know, the dollar itself. It's, you know, every asset goes to create the stability. And if you have a diverse enough set of uncorrelated assets, you actually come up with a very, very stable currency. So the idea is tokenizing the, call it the net asset value of all of physical and, you know, sort of cash flowing objects and putting that on blockchain uh, and having, you know, the CDP system maker incorporate enough of those so that it actually creates an uncorrelated, stable actual outcome. The idea is if you're borrowing some marginal value of something else, it's more stable than the collective of 100% risk on every asset. So you start to look at it from a theoretical construct and you end up with a much more verifiable system by which you can achieve. So what we're looking to do is, so. We're not the first people to securitize any of the products that we've actually come to market with. Wall Street's been doing it for years. I was involved in Wall Street for a number of years. Um, I think the easiest ones to bring to market are ones that have actually already been done because if they were done, there was reasons to do them. Um, and it's also more, it's easily acceptable from an adoption standpoint. The interesting part is there's a lot of assets out there that haven't been you know, sort of securitized or brought to market for all sorts of different reasons. Um, mostly because you can't hit a critical threshold value of where securitization actually makes sense from a fixed cost standpoint. So we like to bring smaller, more efficient deals that actually would bring broader perspective of assets. Uh, people have already done art, for instance, is you know, provenance and a bunch of other issues need to be resolved on those issues, on those kind of securitization. But the idea is you, if you can bring all of these other assets, which are tangible, real, asset value, you know that you can sell it to someone that has utility to someone else. That kind of liquidity and bringing it to define what is part of the token ecosystem. I think Maker's an important portion of it. I think Dharma's an incredibly important portion of it. If you look at the way that traditional Wall Street has been, um, these fit very nicely into other roles um, in a much more efficient, much more transparent way. So as you build out what I would call a token ecosystem, these are all the beginning layers of what actually defines it. And the point is, if you can replicate what's been done in the past and move it forward and you can start to get more efficiency, I think trying to move too quickly um, and try to skip steps and missing that sort of third party checks and balances is, um, you can break a lot of these systems pretty badly, pretty quickly, as Rin was saying. Mm -hmm. As single collateral, you can death spiral Ethereum pretty quickly if maker shut down, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so having this diverse colla collateral pool is going to be essential to get any sort of very stable long-term token economy. Oh, super. Thanks. And Nadav. And so you're bringing together, um, also you're, you're providing an avenue for people with cryptocurrency to make that liquid. So similarly, you're taking an asset where now there's an avenue for someone to say, hey, I can make it liquid. Can you tell us who your lenders are and who your borrowers are and how this has changed the landscape? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say the, the lender side of the market um, is primarily composed of people like m probably most people in this room, mm -hmm. i.e. like cryptocurrency holders who um, don't have any sort of short-term intention to try to sell or kind of day trade or what have you, 
um, and just want to earn some sort of interest rate on it. Um, and it turns out that there are very few avenues right now on the internet for earning interest on your cryptocurrencies, um, and that most that exist are very technical or difficult to use. Um, and so the Lend side, um, actually kind of contrary to the way most peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms developed throughout like the 2000s um, and beyond is um, like the lender side has a glut of supply whereas the borrower side has, has kind of a scarcity of demand. Um, uh, and on the borrower side, you know, I mentioned this earlier, the, the primary reason why people are borrowing from, from Dharma or from Maker or from um, you know, a variety of different platforms is, is for speculative reasons. It's, it's traders who are trying to um, either short certain crypto assets or um, get leverage on them. Um, <clears throat> uh, and kind of as, you know, I won't beat this horse dead, but, you know, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, like I think that in the near future, you're going to start to see other borrowing use cases come to market um, that are going to be less speculatively driven, um, that are going to be more uh, impactful for, for quote unquote normal people. Yeah. And what do you think some of the headway, uh, you know, some of the things that are making that more difficult is that the time of those loans, the liquidity problems that come in that, what do you, th what do you think would make that come faster into fruition? Yeah, so I, I think that the biggest reason why um, you're not seeing as much um, non-speculative borrowing activity mm -hmm. um, is that it's Basically, like as a really loose heuristic, if you're starting a lending business, um, your job is to find a lot more good borrowers than bad borrowers. Um, so you want to have like you're always going to have people who are fraudulent. You're always going to have people who are going to default. But um, the it's just a numbers game of getting way way more of the good category than the bad category. Um, and the problem is is that um, and the, the reason why kind of um, there is there is a a relatively popular Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer lending platform called BTC Jam mm. that attempted to do essentially unsecured peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin loans um, back in like 13, 14. Um, and they pretty, like, it worked well for a bit um, and then they got overwhelmed with fraud. Mm. Um, and the reason for that was that like, it just, and, and what, what I would describe that to is that um, at the end of the day, it's really hard for most normal people to use cryptocurrencies to pay their bills, buy food, you know, like do the things that unsecured borrowers want to do. Um, and as a result, um, the pool of people who are literate enough in order to be able to take their cryptocurrencies and, and you know, use them in their day-to-day -day lives is pretty small. And the pool of people that you know, know how to take cryptocurrencies and run away with them is way, way, way larger. <laughs> um, and so you end up with this issue where um, uh, essentially like um, it's hard to, to bootstrap a really strong two-sided market um, because there's simply just not enough good borrowers who know how to use cryptocurrencies. Right. Um, these things will change. Um, these things are changing very, very quickly. Um, there are, you know, like the on-ramps and off-ramps are getting better every day. Um, they're going to be seamlessly integrated. Um, and so, you know, this is a temporary artifact, but I, I would say that's probably the biggest blocker right now. Okay, great. Well, it seems to me with all three of you, you've found ways to create greater transparency than we've ever had today, um, which seems to be lowering costs and you're offering yields that would be very attractive in a whole host of ways in a world that's starved from yields. Can you talk a little bit about that, how you've been able to do that, and how important that is to your customers? So I would say, I mean, I really think you can attribute all the advantages of, of you know, open finance to the power of the blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. So it is these like fundamental um, things like transparency, decentralization, and then the efficiency that comes with that, both, I would say, from the technological perspective but also even to some extent from the, how do you, like the, I mean the cultural aspect of having total transparency, right? Because with total transparency, you can't really have things like predatory business practice, right? Because it's so obvious to see that, yeah, you're totally rent seeking and price gouging your customers, right? And also it's so obvious to see, okay, if I go over here, things are gonna, you know, here I'll be treated well and so on, right? So, so it's really also about fundamentally changing business models to something that serves the customers mm. and and then 
you know, going for like loyal, large scale customer bases. And that's, kind of, that's going to be really the name of the game for like the next wave of, of finance really. And hopefully will, you know, impact all the existing financial business models, right? And all the banks will have to, you know, get modern and stop ripping off the customers essentially, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I mean, so it really is the blockchain and sort of that fundamental technology that's driving all of this. That's great. Um, let's see. So the way I look at it is, is the blockchain is, a, is the clearinghouse. It's the settlement clearinghouse. Once you have that public and everything that's known, um, it takes out a whole host of things, as, as Renette said. I mean, I think there's some other issues that are going to have to be solved. Um, on off chain verification is going to be a huge one, especially in the security landscape. Um, how that gets manifested is one thing. Um, the other sort of noise factor, at least from the security standpoint, is uh, seemingly everybody has a new private chain that they're trying to pitch to the institutions to solve whatever speculative problem they think they have. I think the public-private blockchain conversation needs to go away fairly quickly, um, just because it's, it's going to cause a lot of confusion, and then you end up having to explain why it's really not a, a problem. Um, to a whole host of institutions that really don't necessarily understand how this all works. Um, so we have some native problems that need to be resolved, but it is, it is the path forward. I think the biggest advantage that we see in terms of all this is more, there's always gonna be good deals and bad deals. There's gonna be good tokens and shit tokens. I mean, it's just the way that the world's gonna work. Um, but, you know, the way that we're looking at the universe is there's a whole bunch of fixed costs that are associated with trade and settlement that all go away. All of that increases the yields to the end users. Um, and you know, taking out these middle parties that have been sort of strangling yields from you know, the interested you know, individual parties is, well, we can level the playing field a whole bunch more than what it is right now. So I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again? Oh yeah, um, through your technology and the, mm -hmm. and the advancements you're making, whether it's with the transparency, you're able to reduce costs and yeah. increase yields. And if you could tell us really how that's happening. I see, okay, got it. Um, so yeah, I mean like if you look at, um, you know, purely from like a unit transactional basis, like the reason why using smart contracts to administer um, a collateralized loan saves you money, um, is that there's nobody that has to be the sort of trusted third party that holds the collateral or the trusted third party that adjudicates kind of where that collateral ought to go in the case of a, result of a default. Um, so you don't need to have an army of lawyers in the room. You don't need to have, um, you know, a court to enforce the loan. Um, all of this stuff is kind of mediated by immutable smart contract code. Um, and so naturally, you're going to get some sort of efficiency gain there. Um, but what I, I think like that's kind of the short-term reason why there's like an efficiency gain and why, and why I think there's like um, a quote-unquote yield to, to be drawn from the technology. Um, in the longer term, though, like the second order and third order effects is that I think that when you have a permissionless place um, that kind of acts as like the shelling point for all credit liquidity, um, you're going to see uh, essentially like if, if it can attract like all of the world's credit liquidity to one place, um, then by nature of that, you're going to have like the best interest rates in this one location. Um, just by given the fact that it's, it's like a permissionless pool of liquidity. Um, that's a little bit hand wavier. Um, that's like the further down the line type stuff. Um, but, but I do think that that's what's going to move the needle in the future as to why these technologies will be more price efficient than their centralized counterparts. Yeah. And we were talking a little bit about credit ratings or personal credit ratings, transportable credit ratings. So you've got an opportunity, a platform to gather a lot of data about who's lending and who's borrowing. Do you see anything in the future where you'd use that to create some type of database or for people who are coming to borrow to now get a credit rating that they could go and use in other forums? Um, that would be incredible. Um, I, would, I would love to see that come to fruition in some capacity. Um, you know, we discussed this earlier, like um, credit scores kind of suck and um, they're not very portable across borders. They're um, kind of controlled by an oligopoly of, uh, of, of kind of large institutions um, that act and operate fairly opaquely. 
um, and you know, leak all of our data onto the internet and all sorts of good stuff. And arcane algorithms and yeah, a whole bunch of other things. Exactly. Yes. Um, and so you know, there's a lot of it, it, it would definitely like that would be amazing. Um, with that being said, like uh, I, you know, again, I, I think that the bigger I think the bigger blocker here is less like in terms of why we're not seeing unsecured lending is less so credit scoring as like this thing that needs to be innovated. Um, so much as just like cryptocurrencies need to be more useful. Right, right, super. And Todd, likewise, I mean, what, could you take that same type of model and the data that you're collecting to turn around and evaluate projects and evaluate um, the assets as to? I mean, again, you're going to be relying on third-party data for some of this, um, where it comes from, you know, from, I don't know, for real estate, some appraisal or some scoring of what an asset is actually worth would be, you know, and having an objective look and a whole bunch of pricing oracles would be awesome to have on chain. And we'll figure that out. I mean, I think the bigger thing from our aspect is putting KYC AML on chain in some sort of permanent reliant um, fashion. So I'll give you an example. So I run a broker dealer as part of our platform. Um, if I were to take someone else's KYC AML as, as sort of verification for a client, another broker dealer, another platform, anybody else, anybody that's sitting up here, if I took it and they were wrong, I get in trouble. Mm. Right? I get fined, I get all sorts of red list, blacklisted by FINRA, whatever. So the problem is, it's like, how do you have this detrimental, how do you solve this detrimental reliance problem so that on every platform, every user doesn't have to sign up and give away all of their information to everyone? And you know, how does this exist such that it can be, so you get rid of the detrimental reliance problem? That solves a whole host of issues in terms of transferability, interoperability, um, I mean, go on and on, but I feel like that's one of the biggest constraints that every platform has to deal with. Um, but if that gets resolved fairly quickly, um, I think that there's a, a really, you know, I think that's a bigger issue from than credit scoring itself. It's, it's well, opportunities to, to change the landscape. And likewise with DAI, you know, looking at it as an international, maybe a new international um, uh, coin, how would that change business, um, you know, this year? I think CEOs last year said that their biggest problem was a strong dollar in terms of affecting profits beyond trade. I think trade was number six on the list. And so now if, if, if instead we were to use DAI or see DAI emerge like this, how would that transform these kinds of issues? Well, so I guess a tangent I can talk about here is the goal is actually, well, so first of all, eventually there'll be a version of DAI for every fiat currency, mm -hmm. right? Because I mean, the US dollar is the biggest obviously right now and it's sort of the world currency. But in the end, most people actually want to use their own currency, right? They don't want to use the dollar unless they're in Argentina and their own currency sucks. Right? Yeah. Um, but then... No offense to Argentina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 40%. <laughs> 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 At least it's not Venezuela. <laughs> but, but, um, but actually, the plan is also that DAI itself um, are kind of... Because in a, in, a, in a way, there's kind of all, there's room for this... Um, what we think of as, as the central stable coin in, in this mix that, that you sort of use as the starting point for all the other various stable coins you want to make and all the other various synthetic assets and so on. And in the long run, the plan is actually that it shouldn't even be pegged to the dollar. Mm -hmm. It should actually be pegged to something that's fundamentally more globally stable. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of the, 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 the starting point for something like that would be a, a basket of currencies, right? So you kind of like essentially run some math to see how do you come, like how do you create a basket of currencies that actually has lower volatility against pretty much every currency you can you can look at, right? So um, you know, so that that you don't give, a, I guess you can say, almost like unfair advantage to to Americans, for instance, mm -hmm. in terms of stability, but also so that you can you can hold this currency and you have you'll have less exposure to, to things like changing, uh, you know, changing. But like volatility in, in national currencies against each other. Mm. And even eventually, it doesn't even have to be based around currencies themselves, right? It can actually be, you know, CPI and purchasing power. Mm. And through that, you'll finally get like a, a, like a truly independent currency, right? Um, and the thing is just, it's very, like, it's really very difficult to do something like that and actually have it, have it work in a way that's better um, than just, for instance, pegging to the US dollar. 
So it's definitely a long-term goal. Oh, it's asset price currency models as opposed to monetary policy price currency models. And so, I mean, once you get back to hard assets, arguably it's much more stable than any political or monetary <laughs> environment we have. And so over the long term, even as a geopolitical landscape, whether it flattens or whatever, but um, you can actually flatten out the, the cycles of, of currency fluctuations just by backing it by hard assets rather than by policy itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that you're, we'll get there. Terrific. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. You're really the pioneers creating the new platform and testing the veracity of it. So it's really exciting. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.